Good evening, everybody. It is such a pleasure to see all of you here. We are very excited by your presence today at the third lecture of the Distinguished Lecture Series organized by the Department of English, Jamia Melia Islamia. Today we have the honor of hosting Professor Nancy Fraser, Henry A. and Louis Loeb, Professor at the New School for Social Research, who is here to deliver the much anticipated talk titled The COVID Pandemic, a perfect storm of capitalist irrationality and injustice. We will be recording today's lecture and at the same time, it is being live streamed on YouTube. There will be a question and answer session at the end of Professor Fraser's talk and all of you are requested to kindly post your questions in the chat box, which will then be addressed to Professor Fraser. This lecture series is being organized under the guidance of our head of the department, Professor Simi Malhotra. Simi Malhotra is professor and head of the department at the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia, Delhi. Her research interests include contemporary literature and cultural theory, culture studies and heterodox Indian philosophies, theology and aesthetic practices, particularly Sikhism. Her latest publications are the edited books, Food Culture Studies in India, Consumption, Representation and Mediation, and Inhabiting Cyberspace in India, Theory, Perspectives and Challenges, both from Springer in the year 2021. She is the recipient of several grants and awards, the latest being the 2020 Duo India Professor Fellowship Award. I request Simi Ma'am to kindly deliver the welcome address and introduce Professor uh, Fraser. Professor Nancy Fraser, our esteemed speaker this evening, and all others who have joined us from across the world and across time zones, I, on behalf of the Department of English, Shamia Milia Islamia, and our collaborating partner, Department of English and American Studies, University of Würzburg, Germany, extend a very warm welcome to all of you to this Ministry of Education Spark supported distinguished lecture series. Friends, we are delighted to welcome you to the third lecture of this series, which is part of the ongoing project on new terrains of consciousness globalization, sensory environments, and local cultures of knowledge. And I'm very happy to see that my uh, principal investigator in the project, Professor Isabel Kareman, has also joined us from the University of Zurich in Switzerland. We're extremely fortunate to have with us Professor Nancy Fraser, one of the tallest intellectuals of our times as our speaker this evening. It is indeed an honor and privilege for us to host Professor Fraser, and we are all eagerly waiting to hear her speak on a topic that is so pertinent the COVID pandemic, a perfect storm of capitalist irrationality and injustice. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Fraser and I thank her profusely for indulging us and for so readily agreeing to be a part of our series and sharing her time and scholarship with us all this, uh, with us all this evening. I once again extend a very warm welcome to Professor Fraser and all of you. And now it is my honor and privilege to introduce Professor uh, Fraser formally, though she needs no introduction whatsoever. Professor Nancy Fraser is Henry A. and Louise Loe Professor at the New School for Social Research, New York City, visiting research professor at Dartmouth College, and holds an international research chair at the Collège d'Etudes Mondiales. Trained as a philosopher, she specializes in critical theory, social theory, and political philosophy. Her newest book is Cannibal Capitalism, how our system is devouring democracy, care on the planet, and what we can do about it, which was published this very year in 2021. Professor Fraser is the author of The Old is Dying, 2019, Fortunes of Feminism from State-Managed Capitalism to Neoliberal Crisis, 2013, Scales of Justice, Reimagining Political Space in a Globalizing World, 2008, Mapping the Radical Imagination Between Redistribution and Recognition, uh, which was published in 2003, Justice Interrupters, Critical Reflections on the Post-Socialist Condition, 1997, and Unruly Practices, Power, Discourse, and Gender in Contemporary Social Theory in 1989. She has also co-authored Feminism for the 99%, a Manifesto, 2019, Capitalism, a Conversation in Critical Theory, 2018, Redistribution or Recognition, a Political Philosophical Exchange, 2003, and Feminist Contentions, a Philosophical Exchange with, uh, with Selah Ben-Habib, Judith Butler, and Drusilla Cornell in 1994. 
Her other works include Adding Insult to Injury, Nancy Fraser Debates Her Critics, 2008, Pragmatism, Critique, Judgment, Essays for Richard, Richard J. Bernstein, 2004, and Revaluing French Feminism, Critical Essays on Difference, Agency, and Culture, 1992, to name just a few. Professor Fraser has theorized capitalism's relation to social oppression, uh, social reproduction, racial oppression, ecological crisis, feminist movements, and the rise of right-wing populism in a series of linked essays in the New Left Review, Critical Historical Studies, American Affairs, and of course in her book, Fortunes of Feminism. Professor Fraser has made unparalleled contributions to the field of social and political theory, feminist theory, and contemporary philosophical thought. She held a Pascal International Research Chair in Paris from 2008 to 2010, and has received fellowships from the Stanford Humanities Center, the Bunting Institute, the ACLS, the Humanities Research Institute at the University of California, Irvine, uh, and the American Academy in Berlin, to name a few. She taught at Northwestern University, Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, the University of Paris, the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, the University of the Valeric Islands, Palma de Mallorca, besides many others. Professor Fraser has delivered numerous endowed lectures, including the Tanner Lecture on Human Values at Stanford, the Spinoza Lectures, Amsterdam, the Miliband Lecture, London School of Economics, the Gilbert Ryle Lectures, Trent, the Mary Wollstonecraft Lecture, Hull, the Jin Yulin Lectures in Beijing, the Storrs Lecture, Yale Law School, the Messenger Lectures at Cornell, the GM Batista Vico Lecture in New York, the Leibniz Lecture, University of Vienna, the Frankfurt Lectures, and the Patent Lectures in Indiana. In 2011, she was human, Humanita as Visiting Professor of Women's Rights at King's College, Cambridge University, and Donald W. Gordon Fellow at the Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Studies in South Africa. Her work has been translated into more than 20 languages and was cited twice by the Brazilian Supreme Court in decisions upholding marriage equality and affirmative action. A Chevalier of the French Legion of Honor, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a past president of the American Philosophical Association Eastern Division, she is the recipient of six honorary degrees, the Alfred Schutz Prize for Social Philosophy and the Nessim Habif World Prize. Over to you, Professor Fraser. Uh, I can't thank you enough, Professor Fraser, for, for being so generous with your time and for being with us. We are truly, truly honored, Professor Fraser, and we are really looking forward to hearing you speak. Thank you so much, Professor Malhotra, for that uh, very uh, warm and generous introduction and for inviting me to deliver this lecture. It's a real pleasure to be here even uh, in a distanced way and to make contact with all of you. So yes, my, my topic is the COVID pandemic, which I, I want to interpret, uh, as my title says, as a perfect storm of capitalist irrationality and injustice. And my idea is that we often hear, at least in the US, and I assume where you are as well, that COVID-19 has served as a sort of perverse diagnostic, which lights up all the fault lines of our society. And that's certainly true, but we don't hear enough about the social system that generates those fault lines, even though, as I'll try to show, it's the same social system that brought us the virus in the first place, and that is currently blocking our efforts to deal with it. So my proposal is let's stop tiptoeing around and cut to the chase. What the pandemic diagnoses really is the deep seated dysfunctionality of capitalist society. Truth be told, COVID is a perfect storm of capitalist irrationality and injustice. More than anything I can think of in recent memory, it discloses the system's multiple contradictions, ecological, political, social, and economic. All of these are baked into a social order that incentivizes a profit-hungry class of owners to devour the essential conditions of their own existence and more importantly, of ours. It's a system that incentivizes them to guzzle care work, to scarf up nature, to eviscerate public power, to wolf down the wealth of racialized populations 
and to suck dry the energy and creativity of all working people. These, so to speak, I'm running wild with this metaphor, these tasty morsels are essential conditions of commodity production and of capital accumulation, as well as of life on the planet. And that's the rub. Capitalist society is structured in a way that begs the profit makers to gobble them up in order to boost their share prices and, uh, and engorge their bottom lines. At the same time, it absolves them of any obligation to replenish what they take or to repair what they damage. The effect is not only to leave a trail of wreckage across the globe, but also to destabilize the entire jerry-built edifice of capitalist society. COVID, I'm going to suggest, is a textbook demonstration of this proposition. The pandemic is a switch point where all of capitalism's contradiction converge, where cannibalization of nature and care work, of political capacity, peripheralized populations and working classes merge in a lethal binge. Now, to develop this point, I need first to tell you how I understand capitalism. Often it's understood as an economic system which coincides with the range of activities, relations and objects that are monetized, that are held to embody or produce economic value. That view of capitalism as essentially, uh, which equates it with an economic system is far too narrow in my view. What we really need to be focused on is not the economic system per se, but rather the larger social order, the institutionalized social order that makes the economy possible. In other words, we need to look not only at what Marx famously called the hidden abode of production, but at other non-economic abodes, which are even more hidden than that one. To arrive at an understanding of capitalist society, we need to go beyond the economic system to disclose the non-economic conditions that make it possible. And I want to mention four such non-economic conditions for the possibility of a capitalist economy. The first is a sizable fund of unwaged labor devoted to social reproduction. This includes housework, the birthing and rearing of children, the care of adults, including wage workers, the elderly and the unemployed, all of which are aimed at making and sustaining the human beings without whom there could be no workers, no labor power, no necessary or surplus labor time, no exploitation, no sur all of the Marxist litany of things. Capital relies on this unwaged fund of social reproduction, but accords it no monetized value, is unconcerned to replenish it, free rides on it, and seeks to avoid paying for it to the extent as it can. Secondly, there is another non-economic precondition for capitalist economy, namely a large fund of wealth expropriated from subjugated peoples, especially racialized peoples. This wealth includes dependent, unfree, and unwaged or underwaged labor, but also expropriated land, looted mineral and energy deposits, human bodies and bodily organs, all of which serve as inputs to capitalist production for which capital pays little or nothing. I think it's widely understood that expropriated wealth was an indispensable source of capital stockpiling at the start of capitalism's history, as Marx maintained, but it did not stop with the system's maturation. On the contrary, the capitalist economy relies even now on a continuing stream of free or cheap inputs as a major source of accumulation. Alongside and interimbricated with 
exploitation. In the absence of this sort of expropriation of subject peoples, the exploitation of free workers would not be profitable. Yet here too, capital disavows its reliance on such wealth and refuses to pay for its replenishment. A third economic precondition for a capitalist economy is a large fund of so-called free gifts or cheap inputs from non-human nature. These supply the indispensable material substratum of capitalist production, the raw materials that labor transforms, the energy that powers machines, the foodstuffs that power bodies. So arable land, breathable air, potable water, the carbon carrying capacities of the Earth's atmosphere. In the absence of these natural ecological conditions, there could be no economic producers or social reproducers, no wealth to expropriate or free labor to exploit, no capital, no capitalists. Yet again, capital treats nature as a source of free or very cheap gifts to which it helps itself, but which it fails to replenish or repair. Fourth and finally, another non-economic precondition for a capitalist economy is a large fund of public goods supplied by states and other public powers. These include legal orders that guarantee property rights, contracts and free exchange, repressive forces that ensure order, put down rebellions, manage dissent, and enable expropriation both within and beyond state territories. Also a money supply that, st that stores value and enables transactions both within and beyond straight, uh, state borders. Transport and communications infrastructure, a variety of mechanisms for establishing, sorry, for managing system crises. Again, in the absence of all these public goods, there could be no social order, no trust, no exchange, hence no sustained accumulation. Yet capital tends to resent public power and seeks to evade the taxes that are necessary to sustain it. Here too, it does all it can to evade the public power it actually needs. So my general idea here is that each of these four conditions represents an indispensable presupposition of a capitalist economy. Each harbors social relations, social activities, and forms of social wealth that together form the sine qua non for accumulation. Behind capitalism's official institution, wage, labor, production, exchange, and finance, stand their necessary supports and enabling conditions, families, communities, nature, territorial states, political organizations, and civil society, and not least of all, massive amounts and multiple forms of unwaged and expropriated labor. Fundamentally integral to capitalist society, these two are constitutive elements of it. Capitalism, in other words, is no mere economy, but something larger, an institutionalized social order in which an arena of economic activities and relations is marked out from and set apart from other non-economic zones on which the former depend, but which they disavow. So I'm suggesting we leave behind the narrow view of capitalism as an economy and conceive it instead as an institutionalized social order. And that view has major consequences for critical theory today. It enlarges our sense of what is wrong with capitalism and with what must be done to transform it. What's wrong with capitalism it, on the front of injustice is not simply class domination, but gender asymmetry built in to the division between production and reproduction that I've just managed. Also racial, ethnic and imperial oppression, which is baked in to the distinction between exploitation and expropriation that I've just described. The depredation of nature, which is baked in to the hiving off of nature from the realm of value and the free riding that goes along with that. And finally, the 
authoritarianism, the, the anti-democratic forms of political domination that go with the separation of polit public political power from private economic power with the latter licensed to hollow out the former. We also see something else that's wrong with capitalism, a more expanded view, namely its propensity to generate multiple forms of crisis, not just economic and financial crisis, but ecological crisis, crises of care and social reproduction, crises of racial and imperial injustice, crises of the political, both crises of governance, given the hobbled public capacities that capital leaves us, and also crises of hegemony, given the um, widespread uh, forms of discontent and disaffection that this system generates. So we have a system that is unjust on multiple fronts and that, is, that is, has hardwired into it multiple contradictions, multiple crisis tendencies. And, I, uh, and, and that's where it brings us back to the present, to the perfect storm of irrationality and injustice that we see in the COVID pandemic. So let's go through that pandemic step by step now in light of what I've said about capitalism. Let's start first with the question of nature. This is the site of capitalism's ecological contradiction, as I've just explained. It was none other than capital's cannibalization of nature, of that vital support of its own existence and, of course, of ours, that exposed humans to SARS-CoV-2 in the first place. Long harbored by bats in remote caves, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, that is SARS-CoV-2, made the zoonotic leap to us in 2019 from bats by way of some bridging species, possibly pangolins, although that has not yet been definitively established. But what brought the bats into contact with that intermediary and the latter into contact with us was what? The combined effects of global warming on the one hand and tropical deforestation on the other, both processes that are progeny of, you guessed it, capital, driven by its hunger for profit. Together, global warming and tropical deforestation eviscerated the habitats of innumerable species, triggering mass migrations, creating new proximities among previously distanced and now distressed organisms, and promoting novel transfers of pathogens among them. That dynamic has already precipitated a string of viral epics even before COVID, each passed from bats to humans by way of some amplifying host, AIDS via chimpanzees, Nipah via pigs, SARS via civets, mares via camels, and now of course COVID. More of these will come, make no mistake. Such epidemics are the non-accidental byproducts of a social order that puts nature at the mercy of capital. Incentivized to appropriate biophysical wealth as quickly and as cheaply as possible with no responsibility for repair or replenishment, those dedicated to amassing profit decimate rainforests and bombard the atmosphere with greenhouse gases. Hellbent on accumulation in every era, but massively empowered by neoliberalization, they let loose an escalating cascade of lethal plagues. Now, COVID's effects on humans would be horrific under any conditions but they have been incalculably worsened by another strand of the present crisis rooted in another structural contradiction of capitalist society, which has also been sharpened to a fever pitch in the neoliberal era. It is after all, not just nature that capital has cannibalized in this period, but also public power. That too, as I've already said, is an essential ingredient of its diet 
avidly consumed in every phase of the system's development, but devoured with special ferocity in the last 40 years. Sorry, and that's the catch. The political capacities that financialized capital has gorged on are precisely those we could have used to mitigate the pandemic. But no such luck. Well before the COVID outbreak, most states had bowed to the demands of the markets by slashing social spending, including in public health infrastructure and basic research. With some exceptions, notably Cuba, they drew down stockpiles of life-saving equipment, PPE, ventilators, syringes, medicines, test kits. They gutted diagnostic capacities, testing, tracing, modeling, genetic sequencing, and they shrank coordination and treatment capacities, public hospitals, ICU units, ability to organize vaccine production, storage, and distribution. Having eviscerated public infrastructure, moreover, our rulers devolved vital healthcare functions to profit-driven providers and insurers, pharmaceuticals and manufacturers. These firms, which are constitutionally uninterested in and unconstrained by the public interest, now control the lion's share of the world's health-related labor forces and raw materials, machinery and production facilities, supply chains and intellectual property, research institutions and personnel, which together determine our fates, individual and collective. Committed to preserving their profit streams, they form a private force majeure that blocks concerted public action on behalf of humanity. The effects are tragic but unsurprising. A social system that subjects matters of life and death to the law of value was structurally primed from the get-go to abandon untold millions to COVID-19. But that's not all. The collapse of already weak public systems converged with another structural contradiction of capitalist society centered on social reproduction. Always a staple of capital's consumption, care work has been voraciously gobbled up by it in recent years. The same regime that divested from public care infrastructure also broke unions and drove down wages, compelling increased hours of paid work per household, including from primary caregivers. In other words, neoliberalism off offloaded care work onto families and communities at just the moment when it was commandeering the social energies we need to perform it. The effect was to turn capital's inherent tendency to destabilize social reproduction into an acute care crunch. COVID's advent has intensified this strand of crisis too, dumping major new care chores on families and communities, especially onto women who still do the lion's share of unpaid care work. Under lockdown, childcare and schooling shifted into people's homes, leaving parents to take on that burden on top of others in confined domestic spaces not suited at all to those purposes. Many employed women ended up quitting their jobs to care for kids and other relatives, while many others were laid off by employers. Both groups face major losses in position and pay if and when they are able to rejoin the workforce. A third group privileged to keep their jobs and work remotely from home while also performing care work, including for housebound kids, have taken multitasking to new heights of craziness. A fourth group, which includes both women and men, bears the honorific phrase essential workers, but is paid a pittance and treated as disposable, required to brave the, th the threat of infection daily, along with the fear of bringing it home, in order to produce and distribute the stuff that enables others to shelter in place. In each of these cases, the work of social reproduction, now swollen by the pandemic, still falls largely to women, as it has in every phase of capitalism's history. But which women end up in which category depends on color and class. A built-in feature of capitalist society 
Structural racism infuses every aspect of the current crisis. At the global level, it colors the ecological strand. As capital quenches its thirst for cheap nature, largely by seizing land, energy, and mineral wealth from racialized populations who've been deprived of political protection and actionable rights. Subjected variously to conquest, enslavement, genocide, and dispossession, those populations now bear an undue share of the global environmental load. Disproportionately vulnerable to toxic dumping, so-called natural disasters, and multiple lethal impacts of global warming, they now find themselves last in the very long line for vaccination. At the national level, meanwhile, race infects the political and social reproductive strands of the crisis as BIPOC communities are denied access to conditions that promote health, affordable high quality medical care, clean water, nutritious food, safe working and living conditions. No wonder then, their members are disproportionately infected and killed by COVID. The reasons are not mysterious, poverty and inferior healthcare, pre-existing medical conditions linked to stress, poor nutrition and exposure to toxins, over-representation in frontline jobs that cannot be performed remotely, lack of resources that would permit them to refuse unsafe wealth and lack of labor rights that would permit them to win protections inferior housing and living arrangements that don't allow for social distancing and that facilitate transmission, and of course, diminished access to the vaccine. Together, these conditions have expanded the meaning of the slogan, Black Lives Matter, synergizing with its original reference to political, to, sorry, to police violence and helping to fuel ongoing protests. Color, moreover, is deeply entwined with class in the capitalist world system generally and the present period particularly. In fact, the two are hard to separate as the category essential worker shows. If we leave aside medical professionals, that designation covers migrant farm workers, immigrant meat packing and slaughterhouse workers, Amazon warehouse pickers, UPS drivers, nursing home aides, hospital cleaners, supermarket stockers and cashiers, those who deliver groceries and take out meals. Especially danger, dangerous in COVID times, these jobs are mostly low paid, non-unionized and precarious without benefits or labor protections, subject to intrusive supervision and relentless speed up. Although others hold some of these jobs too, they are disproportionately filled by women and people of color. Taken together, these jobs and those who perform them represent the face of the working class in financialized capitalism, no longer epitomized by the figure of the white male miner, factory operative or construction worker, that class also includes low wage service workers and the vast majority of caregivers. Paid less than the cost of its reproduction when paid at all, this class is expropriated as well as exploited. COVID has exposed this dirty secret as well. By juxtaposing the essential character of that class's work to capital's systematic undervaluation of it, the pandemic testifies to another major contradiction of capitalist society, the inability of markets in labor power to accurately measure the real worth of work. In general then, COVID is a perfect storm of capitalist irrationality and injustice. By ratcheting up the system's inherent defects to the breaking point, it shines a piercing beam on all the structural contradictions of our society. Dragging them out from the shadows and into the daylight, the pandemic reveals capitalism's inherent drive to cannibalize nature up to the very brink of planetary conflagration, to divert our capacities away from the truly essential work of social reproduction, to eviscerate public power, 
to the point where it cannot solve the problems to the system generates, to feed off the ever in decreasing wealth and health of racialized people, to not only exploit, but also expropriate the working class. Truly, we could not ask for a better lesson in social theory, but now comes the hard part, putting that lesson to work in political practice. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fraser. I mean, what a what a rich lecture that was, and you've covered so much ground, and and you've 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 highlighted such important things. And what you say is so true, not just of where you are, but of what what all states which work in collusion with capitalism one way or the other also face. So I mean, it's exactly the same story, I think, which is reproduced in all parts of the world. But but so much, I mean, so so much. Uh, material for us to think through in your lecture, Professor Fraser, but I think one of the most important uh, points which you highlighted uh, about, uh, about looking at the fault lines, especially as we uh, look at capitalism's irrationality and injustice through the, through the lens of the COVID pandemic in some senses, is that the contradictions which have come to the fore have never been as stark as they are uh, currently facing, enough, uh, facing us starkly in our faces in some senses. But I think this is very, very significant and important, which is that we can't simply reduce uh, and understand capitalism through a narrow definition of simply reducing it to economism. But I think uh, what you what you said, which is that there are essential and absolutely vital building blocks, which actually are preconditions for capitalism to not just produce, but also to reproduce itself is so important and which often gets elided in a lot of discourses on how we look at capitalism. And I think whether it's to talk about the unwaged labor or whether it's to talk about the uh, expropriation of wealth of people or whether it's to expropriate nature or whether it's to, uh, it's to look at how public good itself gets, uh, gets, uh, gets uh, drawn in by capitalism to survive in some senses. Uh, uh, and, and to produce a certain kind of an institutionalized social order that you've talked about uh, is how we need to look at capitalism and what it does therefore for us. And thank you so much for highlighting for us that what are the problems with capitalism and how we need to look at these problems, uh, not just in terms of the class and gender asymmetry, which is so central to your work in any case, but also of, of racial and ethnic uh, asymmetry, which also it perpetrates in some senses, as also a certain kind of a degradation of nature, which is so... Uh, immediate uh, and like you said that the COVID pandemic in some senses is 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 telling us and is is, is asking us to look at how uh, a certain kind of a, uh, uh, expropriation of nature has resulted in these uh, uh, these capitalist infused crises which are which are constantly uh, coming to us and will probably continue to come to us unless we try to do something about it and I think that's what we'd like to also hear you speak on and probably the question and answer round but I think what is also very important, and this is something that we need to think about, which is the whole uh, whole um, uh, emphasis which is put on authoritarianism and a certain kind of a disinvestment from democratic principles itself, which is uh, which is what we are encountering in all parts of the world, uh, apart from just a few exceptions in some senses. And so, of course, the general crisis which you've out outlined for us, not just of uh, ecological, political, social reproduction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, the awe of nature itself is so, so uh, important. And I think the most significant takeaway from your lecture is about uh, the cannibalization of nature itself, which is precisely how we have the pandemic in the first place. And, uh, and I think uh, all the warning signs and all the cautions that you've highlighted, whether it's global warming or whether it's tropical deforestation and uh, you know, leading to mass migrations, uh, which we are encountering, these, these large structural changes, which are very much part of us, our, 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 our social world in some senses is so significant. But for us, I think we need to think about that if there has been a cannibalization of public uh, good and public power, and this we've seen uh, play out not just in, uh, in the US, but in all parts of the world, uh, how do we possibly counter that disinvestment from public power? What is the way out? I mean, slogans are important, Black Lives Matter, but at the same point of time, I mean, what do we do about it? I think that's a very pertinent question which you've signposted for us and we all need to think about that. And, and so I can't thank you enough, Professor Fraser, for this extremely, extremely rich talk. And uh, we'll have uh, a lot to think about beyond this talk, to think about how are the, how, what are the ways in which we can actually counter this capitalist irrationality and injustice, which is 
uh, become all the more immediate in the climate of the COVID pandemic. So thank you so much, Professor Fraser. I mean, that was such a stimulating and an intellectually rich talk, and I can't thank you enough for it. And I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions which are there for you. And so I will ask my colleague, um, uh, Sakshi Dogra, to help you take those questions. So she will probably assist you by reading some of the questions to you and uh, clubbing some of the similar questions together. And then probably you can respond, Professor Fraser. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Fraser. That was a very interesting talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I can see that there are a lot of comments and a lot of questions here. And everyone's really looking forward to interact with you. Uh, first and foremost, I believe uh, Professor Isabel Karaman has also joined us today. And she would uh, you know, like to uh, ask you a question. Perhaps, you know, uh, Zara, if you could uh, unmute Professor Karaman. And then maybe I can band a couple of questions together and then you know, post them to you. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the double honor of first question and of asking it myself. Uh, Professor Fraser, many thanks for this uh, extremely convincing and also extremely chilling analysis of the current situation uh, we are facing um, across uh, this globe. Um, I would like to um, invite you to include one other term uh, in your analysis, which you haven't touched on um, in this uh, lecture yet, and that is the term of politics and especially of nationalist and populist governments. And I would be interested in hearing your opinion on how these uh, relate to capitalism, because in your analysis, you, you talked about states and state structures as um, maybe a uh, willing um, accomplices of capitalism, maybe also victims of capitalism. Uh, but could you say a little bit more uh, about uh, politics uh, as it would feature in your analysis? Thank you. Well, thank you for a, a great question, um, Isabel, if I may. Um, yeah, so um, I really I, uh, understand the political um, well, not just the political, but the whole question of crisis on two levels. There is a structural level, which is mainly what I focused on, on in this lecture. I, I tried to show how the whole design of the capitalist order is one that uh, has baked into it the incentive for this kind of free riding or cannibalization on the background conditions. And seen from that point of view, we could talk about the political as one of those background conditions that gets hollowed out. Um, uh, well, that tends to get hollowed out in all of capitalism's history, but has, as I said, especially been subject to that hollowing out in the neoliberal era, which removed some prior uh, restraints on capital. But that's only the structural level. Now, there's also uh, the question of how people respond to the effects of all this. And that's where we get to politics in the sense that you've asked about. It's not just a structural crisis of governance, but there's also a political crisis of hegemony. And here I'm, I'm obviously drawing on Gramsci, who has, uh, whom I find um, extremely useful for thinking about this aspect of things. Now, I have um, uh, written about uh, what I call progressive neoliberalism, which uh, was the hegemonic ruling block in many countries throughout the world recent, until fairly recently. In the United States, that's the sort of uh, Clinton-Obama wing of the Democratic Party. In India, I suppose it's the Congress. Right now, basically, and, and, and all the parties that, are, that call themselves socialist or social democratic throughout Europe and, and much of Latin America, right? Um, these, uh, these parties, which we think of as progressive and certainly in, in comparison to what we've got now to what has replaced them, these parties actually were the enablers and the consolidators of neoliberalization. It was under their watch. Remember, I kept speaking about 40 years. So uh, Modi hasn't been in power for 40 years. Trump was mercifully only in power for four. Um, there's a, a whole prehistory here in which these progressive political 
uh, governments uh, oversaw the financialization of the world economy and basically loosened all restrictions. You know, not that those restrictions were so great before, but loosened them um, and uh, really accelerated this whole cannibalizing process. So naturally, um, as the effects of this uh, began to impinge very, very um, graphically, very intensely in people's lives, they began to respond. Now, they responded in all kinds of different ways. Just to stick to the US, we got sort of uh, these two parallel responses, the Trump movement on the one hand, the Bernie Sanders movement on the other. In India, you got Hindu nationalism. What, you, what if anything, you got on the left? I'm not, I don't know. I don't know your situation well enough. You'll have to tell me. But in many countries, you got this uh, divided response. Um, you got Brexit on the one side and Jeremy Corbyn in the other in, in the UK. Uh, and, and on and on. I won't, I won't give other examples. So uh, th this is a moment of hegemonic crisis. The the sort of uh, heretofore dominant worldview, the dominant common sense, the, the dominant idea of what the social order is and should be has lost a lot of its credibility. There have been mass defections from it. And we're in a situation in which many people are frantically searching for some alternative, some way of understanding what's going on some political project for addressing it. And remember uh, Gramsci's phrase, uh, this is an interregnum, the old is dying, but the new cannot be born in the interregnum, appear all sorts of morbid symptoms. This authoritarian populism in all of its forms, in some cases it's worse than populism, you could even call it neo-fascism. This is all, these are all the morbid symptoms. Now, what I wanna say, and this is a little bit heretical perhaps, I don't know if you'll agree with me if Modi fits into this uh, idea, but I would say that uh, Trump and um, many of its counterparts, many of his counterparts throughout the world are, um, there's something hollow about this. I would talk, I would, I would mention Bolsonaro from Brazil in this. There's something hollow about these guys. They're like the front men in the Wizard of Oz who stand in front of the curtain, preening and strutting. And, you know, uh, but something else is going on behind the curtain. And that's the banks and the IMF and, and Wall Street and uh, IT, it's Google, it's, it's Facebook, it's Apple. Uh, it, it's it's um, the coltan mining uh, interests and so on and so forth. Um, and so I, I sort of think that we're, um, we tend to get drawn into a, a sort of sham diversionary battle against the front men. And so of course, all those progressive neoliberals um, say, oh, you on the left, drop these ambitious anti-counter-systemic projects, come hide behind our skirts, come back to us. You need to be strong to fight the fascists at the door. But I think that's completely wrong. First of all, with a few exceptions, possibly Hungary, I, I'm not even sure what to say about that. The fascists are not really at the door. There is still time. And the only way to keep them away from the door is to actually offer their supporters a real alternative, not the same progressive neoliberalism that d destroyed their living conditions and is, is hollowing out, uh, creating all these cannibalizing conditions, but a genuine anti-capitalist uh, um, project. You could call it left populist. You could call it, as people are starting to do now in the United States, democratic socialist. Uh, whatever, uh, you know, whatever, uh, how exactly we define it, what its precise content it remains to be invented. But my idea is that um, that's the only thing that can actually disrupt this 
vicious cycle in which progressive neoliberalism alternates with regressive neoliberalism, with uh, authoritarian populism, which is still behind the, our, it, it, its rhetoric, neoliberal. So uh, that's my, maybe that's not a short answer, but anyway, that's uh, the beginnings of an answer to how I see the sort of political face of all of this. Uh, Professor Fraser, there's a question by Professor Anuradha Ghosh. Uh, she says, a wonderful lecture, Professor. The irrationality of systems of healthcare and planning to address the COVID pandemic in the developing world seems even more bizarre as illness due to other diseases like TB, cancer, etc. are simply not being treated as several specialized hospitals in different urban centers have been turned to COVID treatment centers and deaths due to other diseases remain diseases remain unaccounted for. Does the COVID phenomena need a focused politico-economic analysis, taking into consideration the situation of the developing world? Um, shall I uh, uh, put one more question, uh, Professor Fraser, or would you like to respond to this first? E either way, it's fine with me. If you... No, no, you please, please, you <laughs> please. Uh, okay. How do you like? All right, it? I'll, I'll respond very, very briefly. Uh, thank you, Professor Gosh. That's absolutely right. We definitely need a much more uh, regionally differentiated analysis. I've sort of thrown everything into one pot to sort of say it uh, quickly, but um, you're you're absolutely right that the. Uh, the situation with regard to public health infrastructure and, and frankly, everything else that I've mentioned um, is not uniform throughout the world. Uh, it, different uh, uh, aspects are differently urgent here as opposed to there and so on. And that certainly needs to be um, developed. What I hope that I, I have done is provide some of the conceptual framework that can be used uh, to uh, develop that kind of analysis. And what I would say, again, going back to sort of the politics of all of this, what's important to me is to show uh, not simply um, how it's worse here than there, although it is, and that does need to, to be shown, but also how there is a single social system that lies at the root of all of the multiply differentially expressed, right, uh, crushing uh, problems that people experience uh, wherever they are. How, how the pandemic is lived, how it impacts people will depend on their situation in the world system. Um, and um, it's not about saying that um, one, uh, one set of, of issues as experienced here it, it takes priority or is worse than another over there. It's about trying to um, uh, create a map, let's say, on which people can locate themselves and their situations and their concerns and the pressing issues that are driving them into political action or into whatever it is they're, they're into. Um, trying to, to give people that kind of a map uh, with the hope that one can see, people can in a sense somehow decenter themselves enough to see how they relate to others on this map who their potential allies are, who their true enemies are. And um, this is why I, I feel it's really important to trace everything back to this one social system I'm calling cannibal capitalism, which um, I think uh, is the sort of principal driving mechanism of all of this. 
Uh, Dr. Atwar Shah says, uh, Professor Fraser, my question is, where will this cannibalistic production go from here amid the unprecedented public health and economic crisis? We see a monstrous rise of commercial real estate and pharma companies have prospered like anything. China producing masks for the world and selling everything it produces now. I think the investor pool may be looking for that stickiness of the market, but common masses in deep trouble. I mean, can we imagine where will it end? Will this capitalist block talk of any fake waves in future for their production and capital to grow? Will capitalism sustain the pandemic further? And Attached to that question is a question uh, by Praveen Kumar, who says, Professor Nancy, I agree with you that the capitalist structure is responsible for many problems the world is facing. But I find it difficult to reconcile the fact that capitalism is still the most preferred system around which governments in most advanced nations are formed. Thank you both for great questions. Um, they're very challenging. Uh, let me say in response to the first question, um, I think we can't know for sure uh, where uh, things will go for, from here. I can uh, envision several different scenarios without being able to say which one is the most likely uh, to happen. First of all, capitalism is an immensely inventive system, it's been, it has managed to reinvent itself in the face of other very severe crises, such as the 1930s, uh, most recently. Um, and I would say we can't rule out the possibility that it will find some way to reinvent itself again. This would not be a, if so, this would not be a full sort of solution to a full overcoming of its contradictions and crisis tendencies, but it would it might be a provisional or temporary, um, you know, um, uh, displacement or um, uh, circumvention, finessing, softening, uh, which I think we could say um, was the case with the invention of, in the US, the New Deal order, the developmental state in the uh, post-independence uh, world, social democracy in Europe, and so on and so forth. Uh, this was a, still uh, uh, full of injustices and so on. I'm not going to go into the obvious there. But uh, um, so I, I would say we can't rule it out. But in a sense, I do believe that global heating might be um, a, a development um, of a somewhat different order. One that actually seems to uh, suggest some kind of hard external limit. The, how, how long can, can that just be displaced or finessed through these sham carbon trading schemes and, and all of that kind of stuff, green, and, uh, green capitalism, so-called. Um, uh, if, if there is a sort of hard limit, that might be it. Um, okay, but what are the possible scenarios? So one is the in invention of a new kind of capitalism that defers the acute crisis, at least not maybe not for everyone, let's say at least for those uh, regions and populations that are... Um, most wealthy and have the military forces and other, uh, you know, um, hardware that you need uh, to shield yourself at least temporarily from the worst. Um, another possibility is um, some that there is uh, capital doesn't find a solution. Um, the left doesn't mount a, a credible alternative. And then you just get some kind of uh, ongoing, um, I don't know, devolution, uh, like like in, like you see in these Mel Gibson movies, you know, war, warlords and and life, every one for themselves, and and you know, a, a, a kind of just um, I don't know, civilizational regression of some kind. Um, but of course, the the option that I think we need to fight like hell for is the one I just mentioned, and that is a counter-systemic alternative. 
um, we need to think about, um, first of all, what a kind of democratic eco-socialism would look like, which I don't think we know at this point. We have, have you know, this idea or that idea, but we need a lot of sustained reflection about that, um, as well as um, um, the kind of uh, political organizing that, like I said before, can forge the linkages. You, we don't create political ferment and political struggle. Capitalism creates that, it's there. But the question is, can we uh, find a way to uh, respond that encourages the formation of a broad counter hegemonic block that is powerful enough, that has the, a broad enough vision to right, uh, project itself as a credible alternative to reactionary populism on the one side, progressive neoliberalism on the other, and so on and so forth. Okay, um, why is capitalism still preferred? Um, well, um, I sort of am torn between two kinds of answers. The first is, um, I'm not sure that it is still preferred uh, everywhere. I mean, who would have predicted the, the rise of, of democratic socialism in the United States? The, the belly of the beast of all places. It, it sort of um, suggests that um, maybe enough time has passed since the demise of, uh, of Soviet communism and so on that, um, you know, that, there, that people can hear that word socialism differently now. This is not true everywhere. I would say in Europe, the word socialism is still associated with the political parties that brought us neoliberalism. So the US is a little different. Um, maybe that word is less tainted for us because it's been so absent for so long. Um, in any case, um, like I say, in this kind of an interregnum, um, people are uh, really engaged in a kind of frantic search for alternatives, options that would have been completely unthinkable uh, not so long ago can now be at least contemplated, entertained, discussed. There is a kind of, of, of widening of the, you know, uh, the, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the constraints in public sphere discourse are loosening. Now that's, what allows the worst to appear in the, in the public sphere as well as the best. So it's not an unmitigated uh, positive, but um, I think it does mean that anti-capitalism has more of a chance to flourish now. I would say um, part of the issue is what people understand by capitalism. I mean, I, sometimes people um, say things to me when I have these discussions like, well, didn't uh, capitalism bring us the vaccine? People think that capitalism deserves credit for the vaccine when in fact, I don't know about, um, uh, about India um, per se, but I can tell you that in the US, it's the National Institutes of Health, which is a government institute that developed the messenger RNA technology that brought us one class of, va of vaccines, just as the US Defense Department among its many horrific uh, children uh, brought us the internet or at least an early version of it. So um, I, I think we have to um, sort of push back against the idea that capitalism is the thing that's responsible for all the, you know, the so-called progress that we enjoy. Um, and I would say um, it's still the case, and this is maybe the downside, there are also some upsides of the social media revolution. It seems to me that whatever uh, else it's doing in terms of disinformation on the one side and networking you know, uh, on the other, another thing it's doing is kind of giving a new charisma to consumer lifestyles with the whole ecology of algorithms and influencers and, and all of this kind of stuff. So um, part of what I think is, is needed 
is the capacity to project a, a qualitatively different and better way of living than one focused on buying stuff that in the end cannot make us happy after all. Um, uh, because capitalism still gets some charisma from this consumerism. It also gets some charisma, maybe that I should stop at this point, um, from the way progressive neoliberals have linked it up with feminism and other uh, seemingly uh, and, and, and actually progressive political movements by, by offering us this kind of thin liberal meritocratic crack the glass ceiling lean in kind of feminism that is linked to, to capitalism and that capitalism borrows charisma from. This is why I wanted to get um, involved in the manifesto feminism for the 99%, which for me, what it's not a perfect uh, piece of work, um, but um, whatever its shortcomings, it's at least a, a kind of a model for the kind of um, agitational writing as opposed to the more theoretical writing that I usually do um, that is aimed at breaking up that progressive neoliberal party and offering this kind of left alternative. And I would like to see a, uh, an environmentalism for the 99%, an anti-racism for the 90 and, and so on and so forth. Actually, I would say that um, many, um, uh, many segments of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US are the equivalent of a 99% movement. Not all, there's still a, a danger that this gets co-opted with the sort of uh, black faces in high places model of, uh, of uh, racial progress that uh, was represented by Barack Obama. Uh, but um, uh, in any case, um, I think we need a lot of pushback against all of these sham sort of uh, celebrations about why capitalism is the best system. Professor Fraser, I understand that we have overflowed time, but I was wondering, could you would you be comfortable taking up a couple of more uh, questions? Okay, sure. All right. Um, Bibin Thomas asks, uh, says, uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture, Professor Fraser. Could you shed some light on how union busting and the exploitation within the gig economy is exacerbated due to the pandemic? Um, there is also a question in terms of um, alternatives. Uh, Professor Fraser, I'm Dr. Zahid Zamri from uh, Malaysia. With the, with the subsumption of every immaterial thing to global capitalism, do you think that theoretical products by post-colonial or indigenous socio-political thoughts may contribute to an effective counter-hegemonic project? Great. Um, yeah, thank, thanks very much. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know, um, you know, again, in, in, from the US point of view, the union, um, the assault on unions has already progressed quite far, even before the pandemic. Um, we, uh, at the same time, what is more recent, is the um, attempts, uh, lots of, of union organizing of, uh, of um, uh, service workers, of hospital workers, of um, Amazon workers and so on. You probably know that there was a big Amazon uh, union drive which um, unfortunately failed uh, in, in Alabama. But um, uh, this, as I said in the lecture, I think this low wage service work economy, and we could put gig economy in there with it, um, is the new face of the working class, the pre precarized low wage working class, um, especially uh, given the, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the severe weakening of the traditional manufacturing and construction and mining unions, uh, at least in uh, much of the global North. So um, I think I see these areas uh, as um, 
what I, what I meant by saying the new face of the labor movement, I think this is where we're going to see a lot of organizing. It's difficult to organize in these sectors. Um, but by the way, where there has been a militant labor movement, again, in the U.S., and I can't speak to your situation, is um, uh, among the, the sort of public sector social reproduction workers, among teachers, nurses, uh, other hospital workers and so on. That's, that's the most militant unionized part of the labor movement in our country at the moment. And that's a shift in the gender composition of labor militancy, by the way. It's interesting, as well as uh, that of color too. Um, I definitely think that um, on the second question, um, what did you say? Post-colonial thought, indigenous thought. I definitely think they have uh, uh, big uh, contributions uh, to make, um, uh, and maybe different in, in each case. Uh, I mean, a, 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 a one thing that I, I personally am uh, learning uh, uh, from indigenous struggles is the um, extent to which um, um, environmental struggle and anti-dispossession, anti uh, let's say, um, anti-colonial struggle have been interwoven historically, where the defense of your land, of your habitat, of the place uh, that you inhabit, and is completely intertwined with the defense of whatever political autonomy you've had, with the defense of social reproduction, of livelihoods, and so on. Um, the uh, great Catalan um, uh, ecological economist, Juan uh, Martinez Allier, coined a phrase which I think is unfortunate in some respects, the environmentalism of the poor, he calls it. I don't like that word poor there, but um, uh, maybe we would today say of the, of the South or I don't know what. Uh, but, um, but the idea is great because we have formed our idea of environmentalism uh, in, in a way that is, is very distorted, as if nature protection was somehow a freestanding cause and not entangled with expropriation, with uh, racial imperial injustice, um, and with social reproduction and with political power. It's, it, it's uh, entangled with all of those things. But what we've uh, until recently called environmentalism has what we should actually call, with apologies to Martinez Allier, the environmentalism of the rich. It's only for those whose political rights, whose social reproduction, whose livelihoods are not endangered that you could ever get the idea of nature as a separate thing that needs our protection. Uh, by this, the same argument about in, in feminism for the 99%. It's only, uh, uh, let's say, professional managerial corporate feminists who could imagine that gender was disconnected from unions and, and, and right and, and all of those other things. So um, there are, these are among the, the lessons to be learned. Um, and you can read more about my uh, thoughts on this aspect in um, a recent New Left Review essay I published called Climates of Capital. Uh, I forget what subtitle they gave it. It wasn't my subtitle, something like for a uh, trans-environmental eco-socialism uh, that tries to look at some of the um, strands of, of activism and intellectual work from the global South and uh, tries to think about their contributions, especially in relation to the ecological dimension of things. Um, so yeah, yeah, I would, I would offer that to you. Uh, we have a few more questions, Professor Fraser, but we have unfortunately uh, run out of uh, time. Uh, thank you once again for uh, accommodating us in your very busy schedule, and thank you for such rich responses. I mean, this was this was really wonderful. I would now like to call uh, Shraddha to uh, deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, Sakshi. Um, and hi, everybody, again. It has been a wonderful evening indeed. And on behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, 
I would like to thank everyone who made this event successful. First and foremost, a huge thank you to our speaker, Professor Fraser, who has been so kind to us by giving us so much to think about. This is a call for thinking about the entanglement of capital with wealth and labor, gender, race, and class, human, uh, non-human others, and also nature in the present day and age. We will no doubt be talking about today's discussion for quite some time in the future. Thank you for lending us so much of your time and for sharing your work with us today. As always, thank you to our HOD Professor Simi Manotra, who is the leading force behind this lecture series and today's talk. Thank you to Zera and to Sakshi and everybody on the organizing team uh, who are responsible for running this event so smoothly. And thank you to our audience, everyone who tuned in today from all sorts of time zones and places. Thank you so much, friends. And we hope to see all of you again very soon. Please stay safe and be well. May I just thank all of you in return. Uh, it's been an extremely stimulating uh, conversation, great questions and uh, wonderful comments from all of you. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Professor Fraser. We're so grateful. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>